Uh, okay, so uh, hi class. Uh, I hope you uh, had a good weekend. So this is our second week of uh, online teaching. Uh, uh, maybe uh, I should ask you guys to send us feedbacks uh, based on your experience so far. You know, on uh, your Zoom, you know, uh, if, you know, lecturing uh, outcome and also your experience, and uh, send us emails about uh, any suggestions and uh, and uh, any uh, issues that you run into. Okay, so uh, today uh, I have another guest lecturer, Morian, who is a PhD student from my group, uh, to uh, deliver two lectures on uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, as probabilistic inference. Uh, again, you know, uh, make sure that uh, you know uh, you uh, you know uh, enjoy the class and also uh, stay engaging. Uh, you can raise your hands, type your questions through chat. We have TAs answering your question on the chat, and uh, Mora himself is also monitor monitoring any uh, hand raising uh, for questions. Okay, so uh, Mora, thank you. Why don't you get started? Right. Um, thank you, Eric, for a uh, for quick intro. Um, <clears throat> so today's lecture is going to be the uh, first part uh, of the two parts of reinforcement learning uh, and control uh, through the lens of probabilistic inference in graphical models. Uh, as Eric said, uh, I'll have plenty of time throughout the lecture uh, stopping and uh, you know, give, giving you time to ask questions, uh, but feel free to raise your hand whenever. Um, so just uh, so you know, just looking at what uh, you guys have covered in PGM so far, you know, uh, you had uh, a few modules up until now, uh, with the first module being our presentation exact inference, and you looked at the approximate inference, and you looked at deep learning and generative models, and actually that module was introduced back in 2015. Uh, it was a uh, pretty uh, new module, and uh, this year you also looked into structured learning causal inference, and finally, uh, we're here at module five, RL uh, and control as inference in GM. And actually, uh, the goal uh, of these two lecture module is not to, you know, tell you everything about RL, but rather give you a gentle introduction to the basic concepts of RL, and then uh, really put emphasis and focus on the connections between the control uh, or reinforcement learning uh, and inference uh, in a certain probabilistic graphical model. Right, and we'll see that uh, certain connections and certain, uh, um, you know, certain uh, connections that we can draw between the two can give rise to uh, new algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms um, that we'll uh, talk about. Okay, uh, so this is just a quick note on the material I used in this lecture. Some of this material uh, I sent to the TAs so they can uh, give you as a reading assignment. Um, feel free to check them out after the, after the, the lecture. Um, I wanted to point out that actually in one of the previous guest lectures, you've already probably encountered RL. So uh, before the spring break, I believe Zitting gave a lecture on text generation uh, and other generative models. And one of, the, one of the equations that came up in his lecture is the one that, you, that I have here on the slide. Uh, and you had this basically objective function L that has had two arguments, the Q and theta, where Q is our uh, generative model for the text, uh, and then you try to optimize this three-part objective function for now, just ignoring the KL uh, and the entropy parts. Uh, we can look at the first term, and this first term was actually the reward term. Right? It was a, some sort of non-differentiable function that tried to uh, assign higher values to better uh, generated texts, denoted Y, uh, and uh, they, they try to compare the generated text to the gold standard text, which is Y star. Uh, so the problem uh, with this term is that you can't just directly go and optimize it with the standard you know, back propagation uh, or standard uh, stochastic optimization techniques. Uh, you need to do something uh, different, and this difference is, uh, are, are, are the techniques that are used in reinforcement learning. Um, more generally, objectives of this sort as this term are called stochastic objectives. And they're called stochastic because it's usually an expectation of some function, uh, a function of x, where x is a random variable sampled from some parameter distribution. Uh, so in, in case of RL, this, this parameter distribution will be our policy. We're gonna be sampling actions from this policy. And then our reward will depend on the actions that we're gonna be taking. Uh, so such objective functions often come up in RL as we'll see in this lecture in the next lecture. 
Okay, so this is just a quick recap. Uh, but now uh, let me show you the plan for the module. So in the first part, which is today's lecture, we're going to just go through some concepts, uh, the basic concepts in our own control. Uh, and then I'll introduce the, this uh, graphical model that you see on the right uh, that sort of, um, you know, using inference in this graphical model uh, will be relevant to actually doing reinforcement learning. Right? And we'll see how, how that is relevant. In the second part, we're actually going to go through uh, practical algorithms that you can uh, implement uh, and look at classical key learning and policy gradient methods and, as well as uh, soft key learning and soft policy gradient methods. Uh, that can be derived from this uh, inferential framework. Okay. All right. So uh, so far, uh, we've we're familiar with two paradigms, like large paradigms uh, of uh, machine learning, which is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And from a, from a probabilistic perspective, uh, they differ in terms of what is given and what is the goal, right? In supervised learning, we're given a set of um, data points that represent pairs of variables. Some of them are inputs, some of them are outputs. We're trying to approximate or to learn a model that approximates this um, conditional distribution. Right? In unsupervised learning, uh, we oftentimes don't distinguish between what is input and what is output. We're just trying to learn um, a model that approximates some joint distribution. Right? And oftentimes we don't just care about the joint distribution, we care about certain things that we can do with this joint distribution. For instance, we'd like to be able to compute certain conditionals, maybe sample from this distribution, maybe sample from conditionals. Uh, so all of these tasks we should be able to do after we we'll learn uh, an unsupervised or a supervised uh, model. So uh, graphical models uh, allow us to efficiently represent and manipulate these probability distributions as well as derive learning and inference algorithms such as EM, for example. And, uh, deep learning allows us to represent these uh, you know, different components of these distributions right, in a, in a pretty flexible manner using you know, very deep, very flexible uh, classes of models. Right? But in the end, uh, both supervised and unsupervised learning uh, are basically tools for or approaches for learning certain models that someone else can use later on a downstream task. So for instance, a data scientist would take such a model, such a predictive model, look at the predictions, and then based on these predictions, maybe make certain decisions, right? So these are sort of decision-making assistive tools. Reinforcement learning uh, sort of closes the loop, and instead of trying to build models that can be used by someone else uh, in the downstream task, it formulates the problem as already uh, an agent or an entity that has some sort of agency in some environment. Uh, it has a set of actions, it can interact with this environment or the world, right? Uh, and it tries to optimize directly some utility function, right? So it's, it's trying to basically solve problems, problems uh, in this environment, uh, in a sense, end to end. And so why uh, sequential decision making in NRL? Why is this interesting? Well, one of the motivations that ultimately we're, in certain cases, we're interested in building very uh, autonomous systems or fully autonomous systems that can perceive and interact uh, with the world, can exhibit purposeful uh, goal-directed behavior, that can learn from interactions and adapt to different changes and plan and be able to maximize different utility functions that are either inferred from the situation or maybe specified externally by humans or, or somehow, somehow differently. Right, and RL gives us actually a formal framework for building such autonomous agents, right? So is RL successful? Uh, does it work? Well, um, we know of a uh, few, uh, you know, recent success stories, um, you know, at least uh, in gameplay. We know that if the environment is very well defined, it's self-contained, uh, and we uh, have you know, a lot of computes who allow the agents to, to go and explore this environment almost infinitely. Uh, in the end, the agents are able to learn something that is even better than, uh, than human performance. Um, but also in the real world, uh, there is some progress uh, that's been happening recently, uh, mostly in robotics, where you try to train something in simulation and then you're able to sort of transfer that into, into a real world under, under certain conditions. Okay, so uh, let's start with the, with the basic concepts uh, of RL. So the first basic concept that we have is uh, the marker of decision process or MDP for short. So we'll define MDPs uh, 
as an environment and an agent. An environment has a set of states, an agent has uh, a set of possible actions, and the way that agent interacts with the environment, it senses the environment state, it gets some reward, then it submits an action, environment processes this action, and then outputs the next state and the next reward. And so it's just a cyclic, cyclic procedure. Now, the important thing is that the environment is Markovian, which means that the transitions from state ST to ST plus one actually happen according to this transition operator, uh, PST plus one given ST AT. Uh, and as you can see, it does not depend on the history, it just depends by the assumption, it depends only on the previous state and the previous state in action. Now, the other thing that we have is the reward function, and generally we can say that rewards are also stochastic, so every time you get a reward, uh, it's, it's, it's reward plus some noise, but uh, in expectation, we'll, we'll have some sort of reward uh, function. It may be known or maybe unknown, it may be specified by someone externally, uh, but we assume that there is some underlying uh, reward function that assigns every pair of state in action uh, an expected reward. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the life of the agent or the trajectory, we're going to call it trajectory, is basically a sequence of state action reward tuples, right, that goes from one and then infinitely into the future or until some sort of horizon. Okay, so this is the, the Markov decision process. Now, what can we do with MDPs, right? So the thing, the first thing that we can do with MDPs is try to find a policy, right? And I'll, I'll come back to what a policy is in just a second. Uh, try to find a policy that outputs actions uh, for each given state in the environment, such that the cumulative reward that the, the agent uh, accumulates over the trajectory is maximized, right? So uh, in this case, policy could be uh, either deterministic Right? And in this case, policy would be just a function, a map from states to actions, or it could be a stochastic, which is a more general, uh, which is a more general case. And we're gonna consider you know, this notation pi a given s throughout the rest of the lecture, where every time we select an action, we actually sample it from some distribution. And oftentimes to be being stochastic is uh, is um, more can be can be seen as as, uh, as a better way. Uh, to act in, in the environment. So the other problem that we can solve, uh, that we can pose and solve within the MDP framework is inverse IRL. So uh, in this framework, we assume that we're given a set of optimal trajectories. Let's say they're generated by human or by some expert. Uh, and our goal is to infer the corresponding MDPs. And by infer the corresponding MDP, I mean, uh, what is the reward function that that expert tried to optimize? And sometimes what is the model of the environment. So what is this transition operator of the next state given the previous state in action? Okay. Uh, so for the most of this lecture, we're going to focus on the on the policy search and in general in this module, uh, we're going to just touch upon inverse IRL very briefly. Okay. So we need now to introduce a few more concepts. I've already mentioned this cumulative reward along a trajectory to make things a little bit more formal. Let's define uh, the notion of return. So what is a return? A return is this G function that depends on it, that has index T, which is basically a sum of all future rewards up until some horizon, capital T, from the current time point. Now, if T is infinite, uh, this sequence might diverge right? And uh, therefore we need to uh, introduce some sort of discount factor. And typically it's a multiplicative discounting uh, called gamma, where gamma is between zero and one. And uh, we can write this infinite series in this case that will converge to, um, to something finite, right? So, <clears throat> so this uh, gives us also uh, this ability to write this recursively. So we can say that GT or return at time point T is actually equal to the return at time point uh, so basically the reward that we get, uh, as well as gamma multiplied by the return at the next time point. Okay, so now we can uh, introduce this important concept of the value function in RL. So what is a value function? Basically, the value function of a state S is the expected return at this state, right, if we are following some policy pi. So let me, let me explain this. Uh, with more details, so let's say we have, we are starting at state S. If from this state S onwards, we keep following our policy pi, where policy can be in, this, in, more, in the most general case, stochastic, right? Um, we're gonna 
get different rewards at the, all these subsequent steps. So if we take the, take the expectation over the sequence, we'll get our, our value of the given state. Right. So this is actually a stochastic objective. Right. If we are trying to find a policy that maximizes the value that we're going to get, or that maximizes the expected discounted returns, uh, sorry, rewards, uh, this is going to be uh, exactly trying to solve or to optimize the stochastic objective. So we'll come back uh, to that in the rest of this lecture. Now we can also introduce the value function of the state action pair, uh, which is also called the Q function. And the Q function is basically the same expectation, but now the conditioning is on both the current state and the current taken action. So we assume that we've already taken an action and then we keep following policy onwards. Right? So there is obviously a relationship between uh, those two quantities. So let's just uh, look into how we can, you know, write these relationships. And these uh, relationships are called Bellman equations for the uh, V pi s and V QSA. All right, so the, uh, to do that, I'm just writing here on the slide the definition, again, of the V function, the value function. And I'm going to just expand a little bit uh, this return. All right, so what is a return? Well, we know that the return is a reward plus gamma multiplied by return of the next time step. Uh, now we're going to expand this expectation over policy uh, more explicitly. Right, we're going to write it down as the expectation over the action, right? So first we're in a state S, we're going to take an action according to the policy. So this is the expectation with respect to the policy we're following. And then we're going to transition to the next state according to the state dynamics. So this is, uh, is going to be Therefore, whatever we get after we transition to the next state is going to be weighted both by the probability of the transition and the probability of taking a certain action. Right? And then we're going to get our reward, um, RSA, and gamma discounted return in the next step. Right? And what is this gamma discounted return of the next step? Well, this, this is precisely our definition of the V pi at state S prime, right? Okay. So we basically expanded by one step into the future and uh, sort of expanded this expectation along the action and, and state um, dimensions. So um, we can actually represent this sort of graphically. Imagine that we're in state S, S right? Uh, and then we have two possible actions. So from here, we can go either and take action one or action two. Uh, and then once we've taken the action, the environment can either transition, let's say, to two possible states from each of these nodes. Uh, so each of the black nodes corresponds to a state action pair and each of the white nodes corresponds to the state, right? So we first expand the state into uh, state actions, and then we expand state action according to the transition uh, we're building. Also, we get rewards when we transition from the black circle to the white circle, okay? So this is just diagrammatic uh, representation that is sometimes used in the uh, reinforcement learning literature. Okay, just to give you an example of, uh, you know, how it would look like in a very simple environment. So imagine that we have this environment, such as grid world, which is, uh, you know, five by five grid world. There are certain states. Every state is basically uh, a cell in this grid world. And we're given actions, such as move up, down, left, or right. Uh, so these are the only actions an agent has. And every time the agent takes an action and gets minus one reward, right? Uh, and uh, so, sorry, if the agent actually hits uh, the boundary of the grid and gets minus one reward uh, and there's nothing happening, uh, if the agent comes to the cell A, it teleports regardless of what it does to A prime and gets plus 10, if it goes to B, uh, teleports to B prime and gets plus one, right? Now, if we are to run a random policy, basically randomly select one of these four actions, what we're going to get is uh, we can compute the value function of every state in this grid world uh, that corresponds to this pi random, right? random policy. And as you can see, it's a sort of reasonable. We get pretty high um, you know, expected uh, cumulative return for the cell corresponds to A and B, and something pretty low or negative if we're in the bottom part of the, of the grid world. Okay, so now uh, we can write similarly Bellman equation for the Q function, 
right? Similarly, write down the definition, expand one step ahead, right? Uh, and then expand the definition of the, of the expectation, right? First along the transition to the next state and then along the policy of taking the next action from the, from the new state. Right? And then again, uh, put it together and get a recursive relationship between the original Q function at the initial state action pair and the Q function of the next state and action pair. And anyway, similarly, we can write down, uh, we, can, we can illustrate this with the diagram where we start with a black node, which is a state in action. Then we transition to one of the states from there according to this action. And then from there, we can again, execute our policy and uh, select another, another new action, okay? All right, so what does it mean to actually solve an MVP or solve an RL task? So in, in this case, um, solving an MDP, in fact, means that we can find an optimal policy that achieves high reward in the long run. And so if we define it this way, uh, we can actually uh, sort of rank policies in terms of which one is better, right? And a better policy is a policy that achieves higher expected cumulative rewards from every single state. And to, to, to say it formally, um, we can write it in terms of the value functions. So a policy pi is better than a policy pi prime if for all the states, the corresponding value function for policy pi is better or greater than for policy pi prime, right? So this allows us to sort of uh, evaluate policies and say which one is sort of better than the other, but it also allows us to, um, you know, write down this Bellman optimality equations where we uh, say that there exists an optimal policy, right? And uh, this optimal policy will have this, uh, the corresponding optimal value function that will be the upper bound across all possible value functions, right? So what we're basically saying that this V star at every state S is basically equal to the maximum over the space of possible policies uh, over all V pi S. And we can equ equivalently write this in terms of, you know, max over actions, right? Where we would maximize over actions and we'll integrate out the transitions um, that, the, that the environment specifies. Similarly, we can write down the same thing for the Q function and, you know, define the optimal Q fun function as a, as a Q function, as, as a solution to this maximization problem which we can also write down in the following form. Note that uh, the form on the right of the slide is also recurrent, right? So it's, uh, uh, we have Q star both on the left-hand side as well as on the right-hand side. So this is basically the two uh, Bellman optimality uh, equations that specify, that basically define these uh, V star and, and Q star. And, and, you know, graphically, and here I just copied the same equations for you, Right, graphically, uh, you can think of this sort of expansion or these diagrams where we start from a state, let's say, and then we can expand uh, across all our actions. But now instead of, you know, weighting every branch with the probability assigned by the policy, we can actually take the max. Uh, and assuming that we can start with a state, we can go and expand all the way until the very last state in this tree, and then uh, we can back up and go back in order to compute the optimal value at a given state, right? And when we were backing up, we'll have to just compute the max, maximization, uh, maximization um, whenever we go from you know, a black uh, node to a white node, okay? And similarly, we can do uh, the same thing uh, for, for the Q function, right? So it's, it gives us basically, as long as we know the transition probabilities in the environment, or maybe the environment is really, really simple, and, um, you know, fully, fully, fully specified, we'll be able to compute this V star and Q star by just, you know, unrolling this recursion forward and then making a pass backward, right? So it's sort of a forward, backward, uh, again, algorithm, and we'll see how it actually relates to forward, backward algorithms that we know of um, in uh, hidden Markov models. Okay, now let's say we have these optimal value functions. Can we, uh, can we actually compute optimal policy and, and optimal trajectories? And the answer is yes, we can do that uh, pretty easily. So here we can use the Dirac delta function uh, around the argmax, 
over the Q function that will actually give us the optimal policy. So assuming that Q is optimal, you can easily prove that the corresponding policy is going to be also optimal. Uh, now, if you'd like to recover a set of optimal trajectories, right, uh, so you can start with some state, let's say ST, and then every time you take an action, you're going to follow this argmax kind of optimal policy, and in the end, you'll get an optimal trajectory, right? And this optimal trajectory will have optimal rewards, R1, R2, etc., or uh, T star. Okay, so again, our, our simple grid world example, um, now let's try to, you know, imagine that now we are actually computing this optimal value and the optimal Q function, right? So if we compute the optimal value, and again, we can do that uh, exactly in this case because the environment is so simple, uh, using this recursive relationship, we can get a much higher estimate. If you, if you uh, recall the estimates that we had originally, they were much lower. In this case, we, we get much higher estimates and all of them are positive, right? And then you can also infer the optimal corresponding policy pi star, right? Uh, by computing first the Q star and then taking the argmax and it's, it's pretty intuitive, right? So whenever you're in any cell, you're trying to actually get to the A cell so that you can teleport and, you know, close the loop and keep going between A prime and A and maximize your, your uh, reward. Okay, so uh, these were some basic blocks um, that I just introduced, and this is gonna be sufficient for, uh, for this lecture. So the first building block is the marker decision process, right, that, de uh, that, that is defined by a bunch of distributions, uh, including the initial state distribution, the transition distribution that is Markovian, the policy distribution, and then there is this reward function. Right? We introduce the value function uh, of a policy, uh, and then we uh, define this recursive notion of optimality and a uh, pretty straightforward way to compute it by sort of unrolling forward the recursion and then rolling backwards along this recursion. So, uh, yeah. Any questions until this point? Okay. If there is no questions, uh, let me move forward. Now uh, we'll try to connect that uh, intuition that we just built, this market decision process with inference in a graphical model. Right, and already I define MDP uh, as, a, as a Markov process, right? As a Markov decision process, but how does it, how is it different from a Markov chain? It turns out that the states are in fact a Markov chain. And so we have a transition from state to state to state. Uh, and we also have some actions that affect the next state that we transition to, but we know that this dynamics is Markovian, right? So we have the state dynamics and then we have these controls so we can model both of them as random variables. Some of them are sampled from the policy distribution. Some of them are sampled from this uh, sequential you know, transition probability, right? So. Uh, but now, how do we, the question that is open, sort of how do we define the distribution over rational or optimal trajectories? Because we have not just, you know, these transitions that are arbitrary, we have transitions that are also rewarded. And then we know that the agent is trying to optimize that reward. So how do we sort of upweight the trajectories that are sort of more plausible or higher rewards while downweighting all the suboptimal trajectories? But how can we do that formally? Um, so for this, we can use the following formula. So on the left-hand side, we have the standard MDP, right, and the graphical model, sorry, uh, for, for a Markov process, right? Uh, so on the right-hand side, it is the same, uh, same process, right, but I'm going to augment it uh, with additional variables, 01, 02, 03, etc. And I'm going to call these variables optimality variables. Also note that uh, the nodes that are here, the optimality nodes, um, are going to be auxiliary nodes, but they're going to be observable. And then the rest are going to be hidden. Okay. Now, uh, this on the, on the right-hand side, it's not just a Markov process. Now it's a, it's a hidden Markov process with some observable variables that are denoted with O's. And we have some latent variables, which are S's and A's. And the only thing that we're going to add now uh, once we introduce these variables, we need to introduce the, the conditional distribution that corresponds to this variable given the state and, and action at a given time point, 
to fully specify this model. And this conditional distribution, uh, we're going to define in the following way. So we're going to say that the probability of being optimal at a time point t, which we denote probability of OT is equal to 1, given ST and AT, is uh, actually equal to exponent of the reward uh, at the corresponding time point. So if you get a high reward after taking action A1 from state S1, it means that it is more likely that you are optimal at this time point. Okay, so this is some sort of the notion of, of soft optimality that we introduce here. All right, so why is this model interesting? All right, so why why are these uh, auxiliary kind of uh, observable variables are important? Well, it allows us now to kind of incorporate this information about the reward into a probabilistic generative process, right? Into this into sampling of these trajectories, uh, and we can try to solve now control. Or like trying to uh, you know find this optimal optimal control policy, right? As as uh, using probabilistic inference algorithms in this hidden Markov model, uh, it allows us to specify uh, probabilistically um, a model of the optimal behavior, right? Uh, which will be important for inverse RL, and I'll come back to that uh, in just a second. And it also sort of gives us an explanation of why um, you know stochastic behavior might be preferred. You know, from the exploration perspective, from the transfer uh, learning point of view. So it gives us kind of uh, a new tool, a new instrument of looking at the reinforcement learning, but from a kind of probabilistic perspective. And the construction with these uh, optimality variables are sort of intuitive, but again, they are arbitrary. You can define them slightly differently. Uh, in fact, uh, you, can, you can show that uh, your reward can be um, because you want to normalize, uh, you want to have a normalized conditional distributions, uh, you can actually adjust these rewards by arbitrary kind of shifts, right? And it's still going to be the same model. All right, so what, what can we do right now with this graphical model? Right, so the first thing we can do, well, given a reward, we can try to determine uh, how likely an optimal trajectory, how likely a trajectory to be optimal, right? Or basically we can try to compute the probability of a trajectory tau, given that all the variables throughout were optimal. So we've been acting optimally throughout the, the whole trajectory. Now, the next question that we can answer is, given a collection of trajectories, right, and assuming that these trajectories are actually optimal, can we infer the reward and different priors that whoever generated these trajectories, a demonstrator, an expert, uh, can we actually uh, infer their, their rewards, their internal rewards and uh, their internal priors? And this is basically an uh, inverse RL question, right? Uh, and finally, uh, given a reward, can we infer an optimal policy? And in this notation, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting that we can just write down a conditional distribution, which will be actually an optimal policy. Right? So assuming that we know the rewards, it means that we have fully specified, let's say, the transitions uh, as well as the, the probability of being optimal at a given state, then we can actually go and use the base rule uh, and in fact get the optimal, derive the optimal policy directly from, from the graphical model, which is pretty interesting. So instead of solving the optimization problem, we can solve the inference problem. Okay, so let's try to, uh, let's try to do that actually. Um, first, let's specify the distribution over the optimal trajectories and uh, how this would look like. Well, first, uh, we'll have this, uh, you know, the, the, the probability of the optimality at a given step that we just introduced, right? Uh, now, we're going to say that the probability of a trajectory, given that we've acted optimally, is proportional to the probability of the initial state multiplied by the uh, some action prior, right? And we're going to call this uh, action prior probability of A given ST, and then uh, the, the transition operator, and then finally the fact that we acted optimally in this, at this time point, right? And then we just multiply this across multiple time points. Right, so this is basically a joint probability distribution, and I'm saying just the posterior is uh, proportional to the joint. Uh, one second. There's a question in chat. 
Uh, I guess so there's a question, should probability be uh, proportional to? Um, well, that's a good question. So, one second. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself and just explain what, what you mean. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so my question was like, sh do we scale the rewards to make sure that the probability is a distribution or do we just assume they're proportional and add a normalizing constant partition factor later? So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So we don't have to assume. The only thing that we need to assume is that uh, in fact, rewards are negative in this formalism it's because we don't want our probability to be greater than one, right? Uh, but yeah, for now, we just assume that rewards are adjusted correctly. So, so everything like all this, uh, the, the normalizing constant, everything is shuffled into this uh, reward, right? I, I see, thanks. Okay. Uh, cool. So, Okay, next step, right, from this, uh, we can go and further expand. So we just, you know, I'm just plugging in the first equation on the second one and expanding this further. And then I'm uh, sort of rearranging the terms a little bit. So I'm just putting together everything in the, uh, you know, brackets here, which is everything that corresponds to the dynamics. So this in the square brackets, this is the probability uh, that is assigned by the you know, by the environment, it's like how plausible the trajectory is under the current dynamics, uh, while everything that is under the exponent is basically the up weight of the trajectory proportional to the to the reward. Right. So the more likely uh, the more likely trajectories are going to be uh, up weighted, and this is the action prior. Technically, uh, we can assume that all actions are you know sort of equal, so we can just cross it out for now. But, uh, you know, we don't have to do that. Uh, you, you know, in, in the framework, it allows you to have to play with different priors. And uh, that also, you notice that, you know, different uh, rewards, sort of technically you can shuffle in this action prior into reward as well, right? But, or you can, you, you, you may want to have it like explicitly somewhere to represent certain priors that you have about the behavior of the agent. Okay, so uh, this is uh, so this is the probability, basically the probability over the optimal trajectories, right? Or the posterior probability, uh, given the observed sequence of opt uh, given the fact that the observed sequence was optimal, right? What we could do, we can further. Let's say we don't know the reward, and we're just given a bunch of trajectories. Well, this specifies the likelihood function for us. Right? So this probability of, of the trajectories. So we can use it as a likelihood and we can parameterize the rewards, maybe parameterize the prior. Um, maybe we can even parameterize them, featureize them further and have them as like a feature function multiplied by feature, feature weights. Uh, and now we can learn the reward as well as the prior uh, and try to uh, learn, you know, what is what was the cause or like what was the reward that drove the agents to follow this trajectory? So this is exactly how uh, the problem of inverse reinforcement learning is posed, where you're trying to infer the reward that drove the agents to take a certain trajectory. And note that actually, if you just look at this problem, uh, it's basically a featureized uh, conditional random field. Right? Uh, it's a featureized conditional random field, and in the previous lectures, I believe. Uh, you guys already covered uh, sequential models and uh, conditional random fields. So by solving this model, uh, it, it will be equivalent to solving basically a uh, CRF. And by inferring these potentials, um, like parametric potential functions, uh, you'll be able to learn basically the rewards that you can, you can recover from the trajectories. Okay. Uh, now the next step is, can we get the optimal policy and how can we, uh, you know, optimally plan in, in, this, in this framework. Well, what we're gonna do, we're gonna show that uh, we can actually unroll the dynamics, uh, compute certain backward messages in this HMM model, right? And these backwards messages are gonna be defined as this. So it's probability of being optimal from state ST and action, taking action T and being optimal from point T onwards. Now we'll be able to use these messages actually to compute the uh, optimal policy, which is the probability of action 
given the state st and given the fact that from now on we're going to act optimally. Uh, and finally, we can also compute technically uh, forward messages, right, in this, in this hidden Markov model uh, in order to do state filtering, right? Let's say we don't know which state we're in, uh, but we know that we've acted optimally so far. What is the probability that we are in a, in a certain state? So this can be used uh, for state filtering as well, but this is not something we're going to be looking into, okay? So we're going to focus just on these first two, uh, first two quantities. Okay, so let's expand this backward message just a little bit. Right, again, it's the probability of being optimal from time t onwards. Uh, we just, we'll do some algebraic manipulation. First of all, we're going to introduce st plus 1 and just integrate it out. We can do it with any probability distribution, right? And then on the next step, what we're going to do, we're going to uh, expand this and just factorize this probability distribution, right? So what is, what is this probability distribution? It's basically a uh, probability of being optimal at the current point, condition on st, at, and then probability of transition to the next time point, and then probability of being optimal from st plus one onwards. So uh, the only thing that we don't know is this term. So we need to uh, further expand it. So this term is uh, probability of being optimal starting point t plus one onwards from the state st. And again, we're gonna introduce a new random variable, which is action at time t plus one, and we're gonna integrate it out, right? We're gonna integrate it out with respect to some, let's say prior over actions, okay? You can always do that. Now, uh, this part is basically our, um, our uh, beta t plus one by definition, right? At state st plus one, at plus one, okay? So just, uh, you know, just remember that. Uh, and we can, uh, so what we just did, right, we connected beta t with beta t plus one right, in a sort of recursive, recur a recursive fashion. Right, we can further write it down uh, literally for every single step. And we're going to start from the beta capital T, in which case beta capital T will be just equal to probability of O capital T given st a t, right? Uh, and then we're going to go backwards, right? From like all the all the all the final the final state, and then we're going to go and send these messages backwards in order to compute beta at time step t. Okay, and here I just give you a quick for loop uh, of an algorithm that can help you compute that. So this is this is pretty much identical to the backward pass and the hidden Markov model, right? Uh, and this um, betas are defined as as we introduced on this slide. Uh, and this is a slightly just simplified notation where we, instead of using this integral, we just shuffled it into uh, um, an expectation over, over some probability distribution. Okay, so similarly, we can define also this beta t with a little bit of overload of notation, beta t of st, so of only one argument, where we basically integrate out, and this is exactly what we did here, right? Uh, where we integrated out the action from, from the beta st. And so that's just the expectation with respect to at. Okay, so we introduced this, this, this two new functions, beta t st at and beta t st. And what does it remind us of? Well, it reminds us of actually of the value function that I just introduced in the first part of the lecture, right? So the, uh, let's just denote, okay, the log of the beta t st as vt st and the log of the uh, beta of two arguments as qt as t at, okay? Right, so if we denote this, we can actually write that expectation that I just showed you in the integral form, right? So this is the log of the expectation of uh, inside it, there was like probability of at given st multiplied by the beta, right? And what we get is basically a sort of a soft max relationship between the q function and the v function. And if you remember, uh, so at the very beginning, I gave you this Bellman equations with the maximization, right? Max over the action, right? So this is uh, precisely the same relationship between the optimal V and the optimal Q uh, that we had through maximization. So here we get this relationship through the soft maximization. Right? So instead of max, we get the soft max. Okay, so in, in case of the deterministic dynamics, you can further uh, do this exercise on your own. You can get that uh, 
this q and v, the optimal q and optimal v functions here, actually follow pretty, uh, you know, pretty standard relationship as in the classical RL. So q s t a t is equal to basically reward at the current step plus the value at s t plus one. So I'm omitting right now the gamma. I'm assuming that the rise on the spine end and gamma is equal to one, but you can do pretty much the same derivations with gamma and infinite horizons. Okay. So in case of stochastic dynamics, though, uh, something becomes like a little bit different, a little bit weird, uh, because we have again the reward, but now instead of just the value function, we have the log expectation x of the v function, right? And this is uh, this is a little uh, problematic, and let me explain you uh, why. So this is called the optimistic transition, uh, and this is not good. Why is this not good? Because uh, we look at the value at the next state, okay? And then we exponentiate it before taking the expectation. And the problem is that imagine that you have an optimal value function, in which case, uh, let's say from state st, you can have a lot of possible transitions after taking action et, but one of these transitions is very low probability, but at least to a state that basically where you win a jack, jackpot. Right? So the difference between values on that state and all the other states is pretty huge. Now you exponentiate this, so that difference like skyrockets, right? And then you try to average it with respect to the transition probability. So even though the transition to that jackpot state was very low, uh, and within the Q function, unfortunately, you account it as an exponentiated quantity. So basically it overrides all other potentially negative possible states that you can get into. Uh, so the agent will try to take that action even though it's risky. Uh, so it, basically it will try to seek sort of risky actions that potentially may lead to uh, very high rewards while a lot of probable actions may lead to very low rewards. And so we'll look into this problem a little closer later on, like where, where, where it's coming from. But uh, again, in the deterministic dynamics, standard RL, and the stochastic dynamics, slightly non-standard RL. Okay, so now how do you get the optimal policy? Well, if you put uh, two things together, I'm not gonna go through derivations, but you can get the optimal policy here, right? Um, the optimal policy by dividing the two quantities that we just derived. Basically the exponentiated, uh, the exponentiated uh, Q function divided by the exponentiated uh, P function, right? Uh, and again, so this is, uh, this is what we call the advantage, right? So this is uh, something that is uh, called in reinforcement learning, the difference between Q and V at a given state uh, for a given action is often uh, called the advantage of taking the action AT from state ST. Because this difference basically tells you how advantageous it is to take an action AT uh, over just following a regular policy, in which case your value would have been just the ST, right? So uh, in this, in this, Inferential framework, again, our, our optimal policy resembles to some extent um, something that we could get in, in, uh, in the standard RL. Okay. Uh, so yeah, derivation is, would be an exercise potentially you might encounter in, in the very last homework, uh, depends on the TAs. Um, so the natural interpretation you know, of, of this policy is that it's basically, you wanna act, you know, uh, as close to, uh, you know, optimality as possible, but instead of being fully optimal, right? Instead of using argmax over Q, uh, you're gonna take probability, you're gonna take actions with probability proportional to the exponentiated Q minus V, meaning that you add some sort of randomness in there that can help with exploration as well as randomly uh, break the ties. Right, uh, so as uh, you can technically add here a temperature, right? And by temperature, I mean you can, you know, add, uh, let's say some sort of um, one over alpha, right? So that you can control, and then the higher the temperature, the higher this alpha uh, is gonna be, or free, a free parameter they can just incorporate into your policy. The closer the policy is gonna be to fully random, and then the lower the temperature, the more peaked the policy is gonna be on the, you know, arg max of Q. Right, uh, the more peak it is, the closer it's gonna be to the greedy policy with respect to the optimal Q function. Okay. All right, so, um, so far, 
basically we covered the basic concepts uh, in IRL. Then we covered uh, this sort of, I introduced this new uh, graphical model with a bunch of auxiliary variables. Uh, and then I reduced basically optimal control, right? And I showed that you can do actual optimal control as well as inverse RL using this graphical model and just using very simple inferential procedures. So in this case, it's gonna be just, you know, forward, backward, uh, inference in a hidden graphical model. Right? And then what we did, we derived certain messages and then we redefined these messages in terms of letters that are sort of more uh, familiar to those people who are familiar with RL, right? Uh, and uh, we draw the connections between the two. Right, so solving MDP within this framework becomes basically similar to solving HMM, a CRF, uh, you know, a max entropy uh, model, etc. Uh, and again, the, the, the approach is very, very similar to dynamic programming. Uh, so one thing that I didn't say uh, so far is that actually you need to solve to use the, the procedure that I just uh, defined, uh, you actually need to have access to the transition dynamics. If you don't know the transition dynamics, unfortunately, you will not be able to compute any of these messages, right? So you need to somehow estimate it potentially in practice, right? And uh, uh, there are different techniques to do that. Okay, any questions so far? So there's a question. Right, uh, so the question is, what are the advantages of solving MDP using this method? Um, so we'll come to that in terms of advantages, uh, but right now it's just a new, uh, just a formal framework that allows you to reinterpret reinforcement learning. So we started with a Markov decision process, right, which is a Markovian model. Uh, but then we defined this notion of recursive value functions right? And it wasn't clear how is that related to any sort of probabilistic inference or learning within the framework. So this approach just allows you to reinterpret the whole thing from, from a probabilistic perspective. So there are no clear advantages as like right now. Uh, and it would be, uh, you know, quite application dependent, but we'll see that in fact, using this framework can further derive certain objective functions, which we're going to do in the rest of, of this lecture, going to derive an objective function that corresponds to solving, to doing this inference, right? Uh, and we'll see that this new objective function can actually give rise to a bunch of new algorithms or, you know, algorithms that are alternative to the standard classical cube learning or policy gradients. And we're gonna look into that in the next lecture. Uh, yes, so the question, even without the knowing dynamics, can we find the backward messages via sampling? The answer is yes, so we can do that. Uh, there are some recent papers that actually try to uh, estimate the model via sampling. Um, and uh, yeah, this is definitely possible. But in one way or the other, if you do want to use this policy that is based on the inference directly, right, you need to somehow have an estimate of the transition dynamics or basically the model. Right, so if you've heard uh, there is model-free and model-based RL, so there are certain methods that are model-free that do not try to estimate the transition dynamics in the environment. And then there are model-based methods that do try to estimate this transition dynamics and then do try to use that transition dynamics to make actions. Uh, so sometimes the transition dynamics are very simple. Like in Go, for example, you know exactly uh, after taking an action what it's gonna be the next state. And uh, you know, in, in this case, there is no need to, to, to estimate this transition dynamics at all. Uh, so you can exploit that, you can unroll along the, you can basically simulate your environment using the transition dynamics that you know, or maybe the one that you learned, uh, and use that information uh, to reduce the sample complexity actually, of, your, of your RL algorithms. Okay, so let me move on uh, and actually look right now at uh, the variational inference perspective and the problem which is defined. Um, so, you know, what I introduced right now on the left-hand side, this inferential approach to, to the optimal policy, right? But on the right-hand side, we know that we can actually get the optimal policy by solving this stochastic uh, optimization problem or basically optimizing the stochastic objective, the uh, expected cumulative rewards. 
right? So how are they related? Are they related at all? Can we say that by you know using uh, by by using this inferential policy, we're actually optimizing some sort of objective function? And it turns out, right? It turns out that the answer to this question is yes, which is uh, the most uh, the most interesting the most interesting thing that actually we can try to uh, you know we can find an objective function that by optimizing which we will approximately or exactly recover this inferential, this inferential objective. And I would say this is not new, right? Uh, inference and optimization, we've seen already in variational inference, that variational approach is what, was, what it basically does. Uh, instead of trying to solve this integration problem, right, which can be pretty hard, you can recast it uh, into an optimization problem. And that's the, the essence of the, of the variational methods. Um, okay. So what we're going to do uh, to derive this objective, we're going to look at the KL divergence between two trajectory uh, distributions. So let's just focus for now on the deterministic case. Now we have the, um, uh, the probability over optimal trajectories, right? Probability over tau, which is the, uh, basically the dynamics part, right? And then the, the reward part. Now, and then we can also have another p hat distribution over trajectories that is induced by some policy. So imagine that we have some policy pi, let's say it's a parametric policy uh, with some random parameters uh, that assigns certain probabilities to actions from different states. And then we're gonna define this probability distribution over trajectories as uh, in deterministic case, we're gonna have the indicator function that indi indicates basically that that certain trajectory is just possible or admissible. And then you're gonna weight it by the probabilities of certain actions under the policy, okay? Now, we'd like to now uh, take this distribution, uh, the optimal distribution on the left and take the, the kind of uh, policy produced distribution on the right and like to minimize the divergence between the two distributions. Right, we'll try to match these two distributions or try to find a policy such that uh, the induced uh, distribution of the trajectories matches the optimal distribution of the trajectories. And so we can just expand this uh, and write as given on the slide. So uh, just the expectation uh, where the expectation is taken uh, with respect to you know, this uh, policy distribution. Uh, some terms are duplicated, so we can just cross them out uh, and simplify this expression. Now, after simplification, we'll get uh, this expectation again over trajectories sampled under the policy. And then we, here we have the sum over the rewards minus the log pi is t, right? And what we can do next, we can use the linearity of expectation property, just swap the sum and the expectation, and then again, split it into two terms, right? And what are these terms? Well. On the left-hand side, you have this expected return, which is basically the standard RL objective that is coming from the standard RL. It's our, our stochastic objective, right? And then on the right-hand side, we get just an additional term that denotes the entropy of the policy, right? Or the entropy of the actions that they are generated from this policy. So you can think of this, um, right? Uh, if you optimize the expected return regularized by the entropy of the policy, or in other words, you're trying to select an action from a policy that is as optimal as possible. At the same time, the policy should be as entropic as possible, right? as uncertain as possible. Um, so if you're trying to optimize this objective, basically what I'm saying is that you will recover the inferential policy that would correspond to the optimal distribution. Right, so when when this uh, kullback linear divergence basically is uh, minimized to zero, this is this is what you're gonna get. Okay, uh, now what happens in with the stochastic dynamics case? Well, it's it's a bit trickier. Remember, we had this problem, right? That I mentioned uh, the optimistic behavior, where you try to select actions that might lead to uh, you know under some circumstances. There are some transitions that can give you to very, very high rewards, uh, but your policy or your Q function will be actually tuned towards selecting these actions, right? Uh, so why does this happen, right? The, the problem is that the graphical model that we just defined, uh, it does not distinguish between what is controllable and what is not controllable in our environment. So what is controllable? Controllable uh, things are things that are under control of our policy, 
And our policy is only able to control the actions. So it's not able to control the transition dynamics. But from the graphical model perspective, honestly, there is no difference. So there is this dichotomy between, you know, when you got a high reward, uh, it could be because you followed a good policy, right? And therefore you got a high reward. Or it could be that you followed just uh, a random or like a bad policy, but you got very lucky and under, under the stochastic dynamics of the environment. And the model really does not distinguish between these two cases, right? So you can, uh, you can you know, first introduce the optimal policy and say, hey, um, I want to find a policy, you know, such that given that I obtained a very high reward or given the fact that I've been acting or want to be acting in the future, uh, always optimally, right? What is the action that I want to take, right? So what is the action probability? So this is the question that we're interested in and this is the policy that I would like to infer. Now, on the contrary, you can use exactly the same graphical model and ask a different question. Given that you obtained a high reward, what was your transition probability? And it's a pretty fairly valid, right? So, so this probability distribution is a valid conditional probability distribution that can compute. And, you know, it's not gonna be equal under, you know, uh, general conditions, it's not gonna be equal to the actual transition you know, the prior transition distribution is, as you will, you know, uh, and this is a, the problem, right? So we want to be, to make sure that we're able to sort of infer the optimal action probability uh, and answer the first question, but we don't want the model, we don't want it to allow the model actually to, you know, exploit these dynamics and, and propose policies that are, you know, out beyond sort of the control of the agent. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so the question that we can form formally pose now is that given that you obtained a high reward, right? Given the trajectory, obtained a high reward. Uh, what was the action probability? The your transition probability. That what was your action probability? Right. What was your policy? Given that your transition probability did not change. Right. So we explicitly want to force the equal sign here. Uh, while solving the problem for the optimal policy, okay? So how can we do that, right? So we'd like to find this skew distribution. I'll change a slide of the notation. You'll see why I'm doing that. So instead of pi, I'm gonna use Q, right? So this is the induced uh, distribution from a policy uh, over all trajectories, right? such that uh, it approximates, right, our optimal distribution over trajectories while the dynamics has to comply with the actual dynamics of the environment, right? And so basically this is our Q of tau, this is our optimal probability of tau given the optimality variables. Uh, this is what we wanna do. All right, so we're gonna define this Q as one, t, uh, one to t, a one to t, again, as, as just factorized distribution. Um, the only new thing that we introduce really here is this uh, Q AST, which is uh, which is our policy, right? Uh, and we slightly slightly changed uh, the the you know the notation now instead of pi, we're using Q here, and the the transition dynamics should be untouched, as well as the in distribution over the initial state, right? So what happens is that uh, you know this is the graphical model that we uh, had with this optimality observable optimality variables. Right? and unobservable states and actions. And, you know, this optimality variables induce some certain distribution, given that we know the reward, they induce distribution over trajectories. Now, there is another graphical model where we don't have these optimalities and where the actions, right, are selected given the states according to the QA given ST. Now, I would like to match these two distributions again. I would like to compute the KL divergence, but again, the only difference between this and, and you know, the naive straightforward way would have been that we would not fix these dynamics, but we hear here we explicitly fix the dynamics, right? So instead of writing Q as T plus one given S T A T, we write the actual P. Okay, so now we can actually slightly change the notation to draw the parallel between this and variational inference. So let's denote these observable variables as just X uh, and denote all the, you know, uh, unobserved variables as z, right? So now we'll have this probability of z given x, which will be this posterior 
for uh, you know, conditional probability of latency given observables, uh, as well as we'll introduce this Q function, which will be the Q of Z, right? And if you, if you remember variational autoencoders from previous lectures, this is, uh, this is exactly the graphical model that we can write here, right? So we have this uh, latent variable that generates our observable variables. Observable here are the you know, auxiliary variables, right? And then we're trying to match basically this QZ, our inference distribution, with the actual posterior distribution. And so we're trying to compute the KL between the two. Note that here we just shuffled a lot of variables and basically whole sequences into Z and we shuffled the whole sequence of auxiliary variables into X. Uh, generally speaking, it's, it's a nice recipe when let's say you have a complex problem, maybe you can, not only you have just independent variables, maybe you have graphs of variables or something pretty complex. Uh, in some cases you can shuffle them into these like clusters and build a variational inference type of framework to solve the problems. So this is exactly what we're doing here. Okay. Now, how are we gonna solve this? Well, on the left-hand side, we have this optimal uh, distribution over optimal trajectories. On the right-hand side, we have policy-induced distribution, right? Uh, now we can write down the log probability. So imagine we're trying to uh, you know, just maximize the evidence, right? Maximize, optimize the likelihood of the obs obser observable variables, right? In this case, it's like uh, the, the optimality indicators uh, under the data. So we can just expand this a little bit. We can introduce this Q, right, into our distribution. And then we can use the genesis inequality actually to uh, lower bound our log probability of the observable variables. So this is exactly what we're doing to derive um, to derive uh, variational autoencoders or or simple simple um, you know, um, simple models with uh, x and z variables. Okay, right, so I'm not going through the math. It's it's pretty straightforward. It's just the only thing is that instead of working with x and z, you will have to work with uh, three sequences here. Some of them are latent, some of them are observable. Right, and in the end, you will get this expectation where the expectation with respect to Again, sequences sampled from this Q distribution produced by the policy, and we have log probability of uh, optimality, like log, log joint probability, right, minus log uh, Q. All right. Again, we can further expand this and simplify the notation. We can kill the terms that are identical, right? And we, can, we can further simplify it a little bit uh, and approximate it. Uh, this should be this should be equality, but uh, we can further approximate it and, and get basically our standard again uh, stochastic objective, where we have the standard RL component as well as the um, entropy of the of the policy or entropy of the actions. So basically, we arrived again at the same objective in in, in case of the stochastic dynamics. Right, as we had in, in case of the deterministic dynamics. But the only thing that we had to fix is to ensure that every time the transitions happen, the transitions happen according to the fixed environmental dynamics. Okay, so any questions so far? All right, so uh, I'll go ahead since we're running. Okay, let's see if there is a question. So the question is, can we somehow explicitly force by changing the structure of graph, the conditional independence of the dynamics given the optimal variables? Um, so maybe you can uh, turn on mic and uh, elaborate a little bit on the question. Uh, what do you mean by changing the structure of the graph and why would you do that? Uh, yeah, uh, so our graph originally has this thing where we do inference, if we uh, check the uh, dynamics given the optimality variables, it's not independent, right? So it's right. assuming the optimality condition. So right. does it really have to be that graph? Uh, it doesn't have to be. So let's see. Uh, let's see if I understand your question. So you're saying that if you condition on these variables, so the graph that we get here is not necessarily the graph that will be uh, after conditioning. Uh, so if we condition on uh, optimality variables, we get that the uh, like the dynamics given the optimality variables, it's a different distribution than the dynamics. Uh, uh, that's correct. Yes, this one, right? Yeah, exactly. So can we explicitly force this in, by changing the structure of the graph somehow? 
Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think so. So by, by changing the structure of the, so the graph that basically we're giving, right, is the graph here, the first graph in the, in the middle of the slide. Right. Uh, so the question is like, how exactly do you want to change this graph in order to force that? Uh, and this is unclear, right? Once you condition, so once you condition on these variables, O1, O2, uh, you will get certain paths. So basically your, your next state uh, will depend on a lot more things. So it's, it's will just depend. So there will be like information that propagates to the next state from this conditioning. Yeah. Right. So the, like the only way you can do that, maybe you will have to break basically all these errors, right? Yeah. From action to optimality and from action to the next state. But then in that case, uh, or basically from actions to the optimalities, that's what you'll have to do. Uh, if you do that, then you will not have basically the optimality variables at all in your graph, and that becomes uh, it becomes problematic. Okay. But you know, uh, even if you don't, right, you can still have a simplified graph without these optimality variables, right? And just enforce, just make sure that cer certain potentials or certain uh, conditional distributions are just fixed. Yeah, but I guess like to answer your question, uh, I don't think there is a kind of uh, an edit on the graph level such that uh, it induces the distribution that you actually need. Okay. All right, so, okay, so we're here. Uh, so this is the final objective function that we just derived. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, to get the optimal policy, so how do we do that? Well, we know that we have now this uh, log probability of optimality variables. We have now a lower bound, right? Evidence lower bound uh, that we can try to optimize. And if we optimize that evidence lower bound, what do we get? Well, we can solve it first for, so remember that this, we're not just dealing with evidence lower bound on a simple graphical model with two nodes, right? Every single node is a sequence. Uh, and therefore we need to actually use the sequential structure in order to do, to, do, to compute the, 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 opt, the, optimal, the optimal distribution. And we're going to start again, like with the, with the very last action and state, let's say at the very last time point. So if you do the derivation, uh, you will actually get uh, that Q of AT given as T, it will be proportional to the exponents of the reward at that very last state, right? And then uh, you can actually write it down. You can normalize the distribution. And after normalizing the distribution, you would notice that you, again, we're, we're basically getting um, the exponentiated Q minus V function, right? Where we define Q and V functions in the same way as we defined them before, right? Uh, okay, so this is the base case or the case where we solve this, this problem for the very last time point. Now, uh, to solve it for every single time point, or at least like to solve it until time point uh, T, at which we're, let's say, currently, we'll have to go all the way backwards uh, and keep recomputing uh, our, our Qs basically recursively, right? And uh, the recursive argmax equations are given on the slide here. So basically, a, of, a Q of A of T given as T uh, can be computed as, as, as given this last equation. Uh, and when we are minimizing the elbow, right? So when we are minimizing the elbow, the minimizer will be basically proportional uh, to this expression, right? So the minimizer of the elbow will be Q of AT and ST that is proportional to exponents of the Q S T A T. Right? Uh, and again, uh, Q in this case, after fixing the dynamics, right? Q in this case will be actually equal to the regular Bellman backup equation. Right, Bellman optimality, uh, a kind of relationship between V and R, and it will not no longer going to be uh, optimistic, right? Thanks to the fix that we introduced uh, into the into the dynamics of the uh, environment. So uh, yeah, so a lot of derivations here are missed. So this is an exercise for you guys to go through this, or maybe go through uh, uh, Sergey Levin's tutorial where he actually derives. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these are still not, not derived, so it's, it's a good exercise. Um, yeah, so again, we arrived at the final policy that, that I just showed you. Uh, so 
again, the bottom line is that we can formulate uh, a variational inference problem, right, with the following objective function. And by optimizing this objective function, we're going to arrive at exactly uh, the same probability, a uh, sort of policy that we would get if we were solve this forward-backward inference algorithm within the hidden Markov model. Right. So there is a direct relationship between the two, and uh, we showed it first in the deterministic dynamics. Now we showed it in the stochastic dynamics and more general dynamics. Now, how do you do this algorithmically? All of that we're going to discuss in the next lecture. Uh, but for now, just in summary, uh, here are the graphical models that we worked with, and here are the couple of quantities that we that we introduced and looked at. Um, of course, there is a lot. This was a lot of material in just one lecture, especially like if you're not familiar with RL. Uh, so I highly encourage you just to go through the Sutton's Bartos book, uh, just build the intuition of what these V's and Q functions are. Uh, and how they relate, uh, and uh, before we can move on to the next lecture, okay? okay so there are other possible variants. Um, the one of them I already mentioned, where you can introduce some temperature, right? And uh, now the relationship between V and Q isn't going to be uh, exactly the same. It's going to be somehow scaled by this uh, alpha and one over alpha. Uh, so you can explicitly incorporate that as a hyperparameter, and then uh, talk about like, you know optimality under some temperature uh, and this temperature can sometimes be useful to inject some sort of additional noise into the system to enable kind of exploration or better exploration of the uh, of the of the agents in the environment uh, and of course uh, we emitted the discount factor and we worked with this finite t-step horizon you can obviously extend all of that uh, to the infinite horizon step of course you'll have to solve this like infinite uh, infinite Markov chain with sort of uh, with discounting and there are some uh, math mathematical tricks you have to, to do, but it's, it's all doable. All right, that's it for today. Uh, are there any final questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions, I guess we're exactly on time. So it's 1 uh, 21 p.m. Uh, next lecture is going to be about the algorithms that we can get from from this framework right thank you